Hello everyone, I didn't expect the full room. Tell me if you can hear me fine there in the back. Okay. Um, this feels like a neural link thing. I try not to touch it. So uh, the topic of today's talk is smells like uh, AI FOMO. Basically, it's not. It's going to be more of a motivational talk than an educational one because there are like thousands of blog posts, books, and courses out there. This is more like for you to. Uh, it's both for software engineers that want to get into the AI space and uh, students that want to build a career in the AI. So my name is Katja, I work at Red Hat. I was considering if I put, should put a disclaimer that the thoughts expressed here are my own and not necessarily my employer, but maybe they will like it. So then it's, I was totally, I totally meant it to represent the company. So um, if you look at this slide, you can see like the usual AI talk with like deep water, uh, futuristic looking, calming. So now that everyone is here and we have the door closed, this is the real title slide. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the whole pitch for the talk. After the talk got accepted, I wrote the rest of the talk. But basically I came up with this joke at some point. And yeah, currently the last couple of years, it feels like everyone is, everyone feels like, oh, that's new thing. We need to do something about it. There are new technologies every week. So you go out for the weekend for two days, you come back on Monday and someone released a new framework, uh, a new tool, and you feel like, okay, I need to catch up. I need to check what's going on there. But the truth is you can never catch up because there are six billions of people on the planet and someone is always doing something while you're sleeping. So, um, <coughs> Uh, fear of FOMO is the abbreviation for fear of missing out. So basically there are lots of technologies, lots of things are changing. I feel like for us as for software engineers, that's quite, so we are used to it, but with AI, it, I feel like it gets more and more on the news. So I had my grandma ask me about what is ChatGPT, that never happened before. So uh, I feel like we need to talk about it. Um, there was, um, we did a demo, so everyone feels like there are all those shiny new words, technologies, everyone is throwing them around. So when you see uh, an abbreviation somewhere that you don't know, you feel like, hmm, maybe I should look it up. Not necessarily. So uh, we had a demo for um, a product we did, uh, like dev stage, so it's not released yet, uh, internally. And uh, after the demo, the, we opened the room for questions, and the first question was, uh, have you tried generative AI to do sentiment analysis? The topic and the demo was for doing pattern detection on time series data. So <coughs> people hear all those words, and then you start thinking, hmm, maybe I should have tried that. Maybe there is a use case to do sentiment analysis on data if we shape the data that way, and maybe sh I should add the retrieval augmented generation because I've heard vector databases are cool this time of year. So you start on going this in circles and trying new things, but you don't necessarily need to do that. <sighs> I had a bit of a complicated flight situation coming in here, and I came out with this story, joke, I don't know. FOMO is like, remember when you land somewhere, there are always some people that stand up and stand there in the aisle. They're not doing anything productive, they just stress you out. You get anxious, maybe I should also stand up, what if they get out there first, what if I'm the last? It's like, nothing helpful is going there, but everyone is stressed. So, <coughs> so, um, the secondary theme of this talk was, as some of you probably the older people here might have noticed. There is uh, secondary puns on some of the grunge songs that I'm going to reference later in the talk uh, from the 90s because I feel like with AI, there is some similarities with grunge music and AI in a sense that 
both of them are rebellious if you look at it from the open source community space. So there are some like huge companies that think they're doing the innovations, but for example, when Llama was leaked, we still don't know if it was accidental or on purpose. Like the week later, there was a new way to fine tune Llama. There was a new way to quantize. So it's like the moment it was released from those selected, I don't know, 50, 100 people at Facebook, Meta, uh, the community came up with a way better ways to do things than they they spent like three years creating that model. So the revolution is happening in the open source space with uh, AI. So with uh, FOMO, you feel like you need to take your time, learn all of those things, but you also need to do your day-to-day -day job um, that you need to hurry up and learn all of those things. And if you don't, well, the train into the bright future will leave without you. And that's not necessarily true. <coughs> so for those of us who have been in tech for 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot of different hype waves. So here are the, like, I think there probably are more, but these are the ones that I was able to remember. So we've seen big data, We've seen like there was like for a couple of years, everyone needed not only the website, but an app. Then there was blockchain and now we are living in the AI LLM hype cycle. So question, who here knows about blockchain? That it exists. Who here can have a technical conversation about blockchain? Who here put something with blockchain in production? You see, we'll be fine. <laughs> um, <coughs> so um, I did uh, a comparison. So this is the results from uh, Google Trends comparing the terms, this uh, frequency of AI versus ML search terms. And you see at the first bump, that's when ChatGPT was released. So essentially the AI hype didn't start two years ago. It just replaced the label. So every time like big data before, I think big data was like, I think 10 years ago, I'm not sure. So it's like technology takes years and years to evolve, but the, later, the labels and what gets on the news can be replaced over time. So, and since ChatGPT was released, you see everyone is screaming AI, AI, AI. ML is still a thing, but it's no longer marketable. That's, I think that similar thing, in my opinion, happened three, five years ago when DevOps was no longer cool. Everyone was started calling themselves SRE. So, Labels changing, technology stays the same. Well, evolving slower, not necessarily the same. <coughs> so, and also uh, I see that with, especially this year, like starting autumn last year, uh, I talked to a lot of people at KubeCon in March and I see like the sentiment amongst engineers is that they want to get off the hype cycle already. So it's like they want to get into the productivity plateau. They want to build real things that solve real problems but the business still is still riding that hype wave for better or for worse. This is a screenshot from, uh, I think it was, yeah, Goldman Sachs. Uh, the how many of the top 500 companies in the world, how often they mentioned the AI wor word in their quarterly calls. And you see 2024, the ball is still rolling up. Again, for better or for worse. <laughs> So mm, here we go again into another hype cycle. So the question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? So I'm going to say something that apparently is a heresy in 2024. Not every problem needs an AI solution. <laughs> <coughs> so um, usually, um, I've talked to a lot of people uh, that are just starting the, because like someone, CTO or whoever told them that we need to do the AI transformation, do something about it. Engineers go in there, it's like um, they, mm, not necessarily engineers, but like starting, start playing with your company's data, what we can do about it. And they have vague problem definition, even vaguer understanding of their data. Let's throw terabytes of data at an AI model and see what happens. Well, garbage in, garbage out. So um, the more uh, correct solution uh, would be uh, 
you need to understand your problem first. So create, do some flowchart, something basic. Take a whiteboard, do some drawing. Do some heuristics implementations, so something smaller. Take a couple of use cases, a couple of data points, and walk yourself through like end-to-end -end what should happen. It will also help you validate your business case or use case, depending on where you are. And also, uh, it will help you understand your problem. Usually, like for me, when I start experimenting, like after a couple of passes, I find corner cases. I find where the data doesn't fit. Maybe we need bit better data. Maybe we don't have enough information in our data to solve the problem. And by the time I've finished implementation of the simple solution, I finally understand the problem. <laughs> And that's then I can pass that problem definition to an AI model so that it can repeat it indefinitely on the newer data sets. Of course, it will need some tweaks, uh, but um, normally this is the healthier approach, in my opinion. So enough of talking what you shouldn't do with AI. Let's, so this is, this is supposed to be motivational talk. <laughs> <laughs> To uh, so to get you into doing more with AI, to not get intimidated by the people who started three years ago, delivered something, failed a lot more. So what can you do to avoid the uh, fear of missing out and do some meaningful progress? So uh, I think the first one should be uh, reducing the external pressure. So curate your inputs. The way, for example, LinkedIn and Twitter is of late, they have the recommender systems that is optimized for engagement. So they try to push you all the things people are liking, reacting, and so on. So there is always someone saying, hey, I spent, so uh, on Monday, I post, well, I spent yesterday 12 hours playing with that thing, and you feel bad. You drink your morning coffee, it's like, damn, I enjoyed my walk yesterday, played with my dog and so on, and that guy did something. I'm useless. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe not everyone reacts that way. But uh, so curate your uh, inputs. Um, so find some trusted sources, either people you trust or websites, blogs, something that will inspire you and give you the tools to do your own thing but will not make you feel bad about your slow progress or something. What I found useful for me was some people on Mastodon. Reddit can be useful unless you go too deep into the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some blog posts, websites um, that I use. Uh, also, uh, some communities on Discord, on Slack. So you, you, you would usually, if you get into any sort of community, will find where they gather, where they discuss things, and so on. So, and Usually it's also a good idea to find a place where you get your weekly news, usually some sort of digest. This is the one I use, Deep Learning AI, uh, for people who have done some AI. P people probably know uh, Andrew, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but basically he did uh, an ML course like 10 years ago on Coursera. So later on he started Deep Learning AI. They have a lot of courses, they have shorter courses, and they also release a weekly digest of the news with some commentary called The Batch. I think they release it in the European time zone on Thursday, so I usually start my Friday with reading some news, um, like what happened, and it gets me going to do some more experiments. Um, I will, sh so the slide deck is uploaded um, on the schedule and there will be also be a QR code at the end. So there will be some links he here, you don't need to take photos. Uh, these are also some websites that I've used before for the weekly summaries, but in the end, I don't have the time to read the news all the time. So I found the batch works best for me, but maybe you will find some angle um, that works better for you. <coughs> the second thing I would say is rediscover the fun or discover the fun if you're getting into the AI right now. So what gets you going? Like, why were you interested in the AI data in the first place? Um, so, and then experiment and play. So find some um, uh, playgrounds, uh, hugging face. I used Kaggle. I didn't use it in the last five years since Google takeover. But like courses, projects, communities, moving, um, like whatever works for you, but experiment, play with new technologies. But also uh, there are endless 
things that you can learn. So don't get stuck in this always learning and not applying always learning things, but not applying them to real problems because there are always new technologies to learn. <coughs> so go play and build something. <coughs> and then after you feel inspired, you know, you know some technologies, you can, you are more or less confident that you can contribute to the community, find an interesting problem, application, or something that you feel is worth your time to invest in it. Uh, because AI field is huge. It's not really a field, it's a tool <laughs> for us to solve problems. So what problems are you interested in solving? Uh, at my work at Red Hat, we work with observability data on OpenShift, Kubernetes, so logs, traces, alerts, and so on. But I love solving those problems, but I also like other things. So outside of work, my more or less area of interest and in application is reinforcement learning, autonomous AI agents applied to robotics mostly. So find something that works for you, contribute to community, to tooling, and work with other people. <coughs> Another thing is focus on the fundamentals. There is always some new tool released every day, so um, it's you can spend a lot of time there. So make sure you understand the fundamentals, fundamentals of understanding data, fundamentals of coding, fundamentals of AI. Um, here are some books that I really like, and you can see the duck from the last year. <laughs> uh, um, these are not necessarily like essential, but it's important to get some context and understanding where the field is going. These are the thing. Th these are the books that I like, but you might find something that interests you if you are going into a specific area of AI. The Artificial Intelligence by Stuart Russell, Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow, and since I'm in the reinforce reinforcement learning field, well, not at work, uh, <coughs> I like the Richard Sutton's book on reinforcement learning. Closer to work responsibilities, these are the two books that I really loved. The first one is Designing Machine Learning Systems. It was released, like this is the book, especially the first two chapters, this is the book that I really wish I read three, four years ago because every single thing in the first two chapters, I was like, we learned all of that with our sweat and blood, honestly. Uh, the second book, it was, it's still in early release. I haven't finished, so you can, on O'Reilly, you can read uh, the early version, but I still didn't finish it, but I'm loving it. So the first book is more about putting in production any ML systems. The second one is about LLMs, Gen AI, and so on. So the deployment and monitoring is similar, but there is al also like, it talks about vector databases and all of the things. I put here in the slides some uh, highlights from the first two chapters because I understand not everyone will get there, but if you're interested in having uh, ML systems in production, I think these are really important points. So the, since I'm trying not to focus on the technology too much, this will be in the slide deck for you to check later. <coughs> so the other thing is, and I think this is the most important if you want, if you are here for the long run and not to do some experiments. Find your communities. So go to local meetups, go to uh, conferences that interest you, uh, talk to people, understand their problems. So this is the whole point of open source, especially like the communities evolving around uh, open source AI projects. <coughs> I've also linked here a couple of articles that I really like. I uh, always, I'm always fascinated. I'm, I work remotely, <laughs> which I really love. But the first article here um, is about the story of how the famous "Attention is all you need" paper came to be. And I, if you're interested in those kind of things, I really recommend it. It basically talks how eight people s came to be in the same office and how that paper actually was written. So it's like if even one person was not there, the history, well, it's still not history, it was like two or three years ago, uh, but it would be completely different. So it's like different people with different experiences, different opinions, different specialization, they made the whole transform architecture a thing. 
And the second one is an interview with Geoffrey Hinton. The, I don't really like the title about, like, there is a lot of fear mongering about AI. It will be the end of us. I believe we need, to, like, I, I left the ethics, data privacy, responsibility, and so on out of this talk because I feel like this is a conversation people need to have one-on-one -on -one and not like broadcasting to an audience. So, uh, but this is also an interesting interview with Geoffrey Hinton. Uh, another one, set realistic goals. I put it here, but I must say I'm bad at it. I set the goals and like one or two weeks later, I pivot to something else. But I also think this is a good thing because the field is evolving all the time and you need to go what interests you, what motivates you. So I put it here, maybe it will work for you, it doesn't work for me, but I think like the process of goal setting is more important for me than following those goals. <coughs> and continuous learning, learn something new every day, like five minutes, check a new framework, but play with some tooling and so on. So the mountain can seem very tall, but if you're doing a small step every day, you will see that a year from now you have made a lot of progress. <coughs> and importantly, take breaks. So don't, like, it's, if you're really inspired, if you're interested in something, it's very easy to, okay, I work Monday to Friday and Saturday, Sunday, I work on my own projects. I tried that and I burn out like after two or three weeks. So you need to take breaks. You need to go out, talk to people, take your dog for a walk, uh, go hiking, whatever you like from sports. Because that's, uh, at least for me, I found that this switch from consuming information, uh, playing with something tangible to the free thinking, creative mode, it really helps to find solutions to problems. <coughs> mm, and the final, so we are more or less done with the uh, strategies to deal with FOMO. This is more of, uh, in the last two years, LLMs, generative AI was used for a lot of things, mostly to entertain us, honestly. So like the music generation, video generation, um, images and so on. So uh, it's been really interesting to prepare some slides in the last couple of years so I don't have to search for the common license images. I can just go to ChatGPT, to Delhi and like, eh, I want a person sitting behind a desk and looking at something. So <laughs> it's easy, but also we need to have the ethics conversation. So they've been as like, um, I've been at an AI ethics conference last last year in Amsterdam, so there like a lot of discussion, especially with the creatives, like what will it mean for them? So like play with the things, use AI, but also have important conversations with people that will be impacted by AI. I feel like AI will definitely change the way we work, the way we not only work, the way we live, but it's important that we keep talking about those things. So I also added, uh, like, keep using AI tools, find a way to use AI tools in your day-to-day. Uh, -day. It can be preparing slides for uh, some talk, generating images, playing with, um, I don't know, video generation, um, writing something. So these are the things that, like, for the last year, I'm more, using the AI more and more for. So for me, coding assistance, uh, I tried that for the first time, I think a couple of months after ChatGPT was released. And I must say it's getting better, especially for the languages that have really, uh, like I would say it works more for Go than for Python, because in Python there are many ways to do the same thing and Go has usually more like recommended way to do things and it's more apparented. So the recommendations for Go are more accurate usually than for Python. But also sometimes I'm really surprised how they can uh, read the context uh, of the surrounding repo. So it can do really interesting things. And one thing about coding assistance, do you remember, I think it was like a couple of months ago when Devon was released the uh, AI software engineer or something. There was like a lot of hype on the news about it. And um, 
they were saying, this is going to be replace software engineers. Software engineers looked at it, looked at how it worked, and basically said, well, it's going to automate the easiest part of my job, which is coding. It's like, dealing with code is easy because you have a deterministic compiler that you're telling things to do. The, mo the most, dif it's like one task that we do as software engineers out of 20. The most difficult part is dealing with people, gathering the requirements and making them explain things to you that make sense and like, okay, if we do this, what do, what do you expect? So it's like, this is the most difficult thing, at least uh, for me. So coding assistant can help. Uh, I wasn't able to, well, I didn't, right? To quantify how much more efficient I am, but for example, switching between languages instead of now, instead of Googling the specific syntax, I just, Usually the uh, autocomplete suggests the right method or the right ending of the method, the parameters, so I don't have to. The second application <coughs> for me is the <coughs> uh, planning, uh, summarization, research. For example, I went to KubeCon in March and I was like checking, okay, what can I do in Paris for three days? It gave me the generic thing, go to the Eiffel Tower, go Louvre. Uh, I went to Louvre, I saw 3,000 people outside, and I decided, nah. <laughs> so next, uh, okay, let's modify the query. I'm interested in science, engineering, and so on. I was like, okay, sure. It's recommended me two really amazing science museums. So if you go to Paris, I really recommend them. Um, so like those kind of things, so using uh, those tools for research, quick summary, but always check your sources or verify it if you're going to use it for something like the uh, news from a couple of years ago when someone used uh, ChatGPT to for law for some lawsuit or something so just don't use it for mission critical things but for summarization um, the other one for me is taking checking text for grammar and style um, like I usually do uh, for some when I'm writing, well, not necessarily email, but some sort of text, I usually do the first draft and then pass it to ChatGPT or other tool for like rewrite it for grammar and syntax. It can recommend things. I'm not sure if it adds the word delve, but I will try to avoid it from now on. <coughs> and then I uh, modify the final. So it's like if it makes sense, if it's kind of still my style, then I will accept it. For me, also, the problem is I speak four or five languages and sometimes it's difficult. I also have attention deficit disorder, so my memory is a bit flaky with the recall. So sometimes it's very difficult to find the words in the right language. So I go to that tool and it helps me some like have a proper sentence instead of uh, disjointed words. And since we're almost at the end, last application for me is I was really enjoying using the Gen AI tools to generate uh, avatars for my, like the images for my Dungeons and Dragons games. Because um, before we were using Hero Forge, and this, with this you can give more directions and so on. But most importantly, don't ask them to draw weapons. This was my attempt at the, this previous character. She's a gnomish rogue, and I was like, okay, let's give her some weapons. Look at this. What is this? <laughs> so, but it makes me feel good that AI doesn't know weapons. <laughs> and that's it from my side. I don't know if it was on time, early, or... Okay. Any questions? I still believe, like the. Uh, so the question was, what if uh, we allow AI to write software for us, the code? Uh, I'm a believer not in autonomous AI agents, even though that's kind of my thing as well, but in the AI being an assistant. So whenever uh, you write the code, it's a suggestion. So it's up to you to verify it and accept it. And I still believe that the person who uh, the commit is signed by, that's the person responsible for the code. So it's like, you can accept the suggestion, but it's on you and not on the AI. <coughs> so, 
Yes. <clears throat> I haven't tried it end to end, but sometimes, uh, like Go is very. S oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the question is, uh, like, we like solving problems, but tests, documentation, all of those things. It's like, can AI do that for us? That's how I would phrase it. So um, I usually like write the body of the method then, and then uh, in coding assistance, if you hit enter, it will also suggest you based on the code that you wrote, it can help you with the documentation. With Go, uh, it's very parented, and then that can be extracted by the compiler to do the documentation for you. So like, Use, you can use it to augment your uh, workflow, but like I don't think we'll get there with completely replacing humans. But it's like having an assistant, like pair programming with an intern. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a technical talk, so it's like. <laughs> <coughs> One more. Okay.